So, I'm uh, Michael Hinge. I'm a senior economist at ORFET, which is the Alliance to Feed the Earth in Disasters. And I'm here to talk to you today about food security and global catastrophic risks and analyzing them from an EA perspective. For example, why is this a topic of interest to effective altruism? What is being done and what remains to be done in this, in this uh, sphere and sector? So, uh, I should say, throughout the talk, uh, if you want to, there is the option to sign up for our newsletter and give your details, but we can talk about that at the end. And we do have uh, internship opportunities as well as uh, opportunities uh, for hiring. We are hiring people and we have recently received some new funding. But yeah, um, overall, this talk is going to cover three key areas. Firstly, we're going to have a high level introduction to food security today, where the catastrophic risks remain and why this is a topic of relevance to effective altruism. Secondly, we're going to discuss what research is currently being done and what we have discovered so far in that research. Then finally, we're going to discuss what next steps remain. There are many. And what you can do to get involved. And yes, so throughout the talk, uh, if you wish to ask questions, we can have quick questions during the talk. Please do put your hand up. Otherwise, we'll have a round of questions at the end. And you can put them through the app, but I, I, I personally feel it's better to just have hands up and we'll do it more directly. So... Looking at food security over the last few decades, huge progress has been made. And the general trend has been downwards over time with periods where it's leveled out. For example, here, there was a sharp rise in global commodity prices, which uh, at least slowed progress for a long period. But it, the general trend has still been downwards. However, again, this only runs from 1970 to 2015. More recently, there has been a slight uptick due to commodity prices rising again. And very recently, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has raised serious questions for this. So overall, the general trend is positive, but significant threats remain. And really, this trend has been driven by three primary things. Firstly, a rise in productivity. A hectare in America back in 1900 would produce, say, two tons of corn. Now it's over 10. And this productivity is ongoing, and there's plenty of opportunities for these uh, productivity raising technologies to be adopted around the world. Secondly, complexity has risen. Foods are now produced in one area and traded across continents. So this is a radical shift from the past when, say, a, a localized drought could lead to a localized famine. Now we can trade to a degree to get out of these shocks. And finally, the world is much richer. We can afford things we couldn't afford before. We can buy our way out of problems. But there are situations where this doesn't apply. And there are significant risks that remain. And this is what we are worried about. So to come on to them, what could happen? What could go wrong even with this situation? Smaller shocks can be traded away. Larger shocks, particularly those that affect key bread baskets, cannot. And we are unprepared for these larger correlated shocks. So this could be climate change, conflict and diseases, conflict being a key one we've seen today. It's almost as if we've lost, to a high degree, the entire area of Ukraine from a trade point of view. And there's the potential that trade from Russia will be significantly disrupted, and we're still looking at that situation. Meanwhile, there could be uh, pest pressures, uh, pandemics like COVID, that if it was a more severe situation could lead to disruptions that would in turn feed into the production system and trade. And all of this could lead to a shock of around 10% of output. So just to put this in context, it's unclear the mortality in a 10% shock, but for example, when this question was asked on Metaculus, what would be the expected mortality in a 10% global loss of food? The mean answer was around 400 million people in terms of direct starvation. This would be a very severe event. And there's the potential for even larger shocks. This would be something that disrupts sunlight. For example, a nuclear winter, a significant volcanic eruption, or an asteroid impact. And that could lead to 80 to 100% of food being lost. And that was... Uh, a recent topic of research for the organization, and I'll discuss that in a second. And then finally, global com complexity is also a huge risk. This is very good for the system. This specialization allows, for example, each country to focus on what it's best at growing and trade for the rest. It allows, for example, a farmer in Europe to source their seeds from Montana from a breeding scheme. Those seeds are coated with a special coating developed from chemicals sourced around the world. This is then shipped to them alongside inputs sourced from Russia, from North Africa, and then machinery from Brazil and America, petroleum from the Middle East to power it all. Then finally, that finished product is exported to Egypt, Thailand, wherever needs it. That is an incredible technology. 
If we lose that suddenly from an event, a disruption, a conflict, anything like that, or solar storm, any event that could significantly disrupt global complexity, that would in turn lead to a very, very bad food shock. We are reliant, for example, approximately 40-ish percent of our yield is reliant directly upon ammonia production from Harbour Bosch. If we lose the ability to do that, we're in real trouble from a global food system. So we believe this meets the three EA pillars of importance, i.e. food, if it's there, is semi easy to ignore. If it isn't there, it becomes your absolute priority. It's tractable, we would argue. There are things that can be done and there are thinking that can be made in this space and it is neglected. The World Food Programme and other organisations have done great research in the 1% to 5% shock range. 10% shocks and larger are almost unconsidered and this could be very bad. So this is where Orfed comes in. We do do some work where we feel there's neglectedness in the 1% range but typically our focus is at approximately 10% of global food output, up to 100% of global food output being lost. So this is in terms of, it's not always necessarily the cleanest to, to demarcate and describe, but it's approximately 10% of global calorie output being disrupted up to 100%. And yes, again, we'll talk about it in more detail, but these are <coughs> some of the events that could be leading to a 10% shock. And based upon projections of, for example, climate change, other factors, we would guess there's around an 80% chance per century over the coming century, for example, of a 10% shock occurring that could have significant mortality. An 80% shock would be lower probability, but still very concerning. For example, the current, uh, the current uh, events around the conflict in Russia-Ukraine has raised the spectre of nuclear war far higher than it has been in people's minds for a long period. And this is a fundamentally unsolved problem that we do need to consider. So ideally, of course, we need, you know, as many, as many practical efforts into reducing the probability of that war in the first place. If the war happens, though, we need something to do. Or we need some plan for how we're going to feed people. Because at the moment, it seems like mortality would be something like 80%. So, global food security presents a clear catastrophic risk. It may also under some arguments, hit the barrier for existential risk or reach the threshold for an existential risk. It probably isn't existential in itself. For example, you'd have hunter-gatherers, people who have the skills to produce food, and at least some people will survive. In humanity's history, we've been driven down to 10,000 people and recovered. But there are concerns, and this feeds into wider EA thinking. For example, if food is heavily stressed, that raises the temperature in the room to a huge degree, and makes other negative actions far more likely. Potentially, we may hit situations where resources, easily accessible resources, are exhausted, and the previous technologies we use to produce them are unavailable, i.e. we collapse completely in complexity and find it very difficult or impossible to recover, which will be a permanent loss of human uh, potential. Or potentially an event, for example, the climate is so damaged or some around this that it just makes it fundamentally impossible to maintain long-term civilization. So there are potential ways this is existential. There are certainly ways this is catastrophic. So let's talk a little bit about what can be done. So this is an example of a volcano. This is uh, Mount Colima, which is in Mexico, and an eruption in 2017. For a more significant eruption that occurs once every approximately 300 to 500 years, there's something like Tambora, which was the year without a summer. Curiously, it's partially in our memory, though not quite. It's, for example, the book Frankenstein was written on a retreat during the summer because the weather was so horrible that people, you know, retreated indoors. But this caused millions to be displaced across Europe, extensive disruptions to agricultural systems, and widespread famine and starvation in both Europe and China from an eruption in Southeast Asia. So if we now look at the projections for a nuclear winter, this is a 150 teragram nuclear winter. The definitions of nuclear winter are typically given in this value, which is the amount of soot emitted into the stratosphere. 150 teragrams is 150 million tons of black soot. This comes from, or this kind of magnitude, would be a full-scale nuclear war between NATO and Russia. This would involve the targeting of both cities and military targets that would generate firestorms and would kick smoke high up into the atmosphere. 
And essentially, the projections are for a disruption to the climate approximately for 10 years, peaking in year three and gradually recovering over that remaining period. But the disruption will be incredibly severe. We're looking at, for example, by year one, probably eight to 10 uh, degrees loss Celsius in the surface temperatures, pushing most crops out of their optimal ranges. Yes. Sorry, just some questions. So 150 TG? Terograms, yes. What is a teragram on this? Uh, it's it's a, a million tons of black soot. Um, so Into the stratosphere, yes. Right. So, so, so this, this stuff about the nuclear winter, I've heard various things about it. Um, so in the, I guess, 80s or 70s or 80s, there was some research about yes. it. Yes. And my understanding was that most... There are, so to be, the initial models left out met large areas and there was significant concern over their accuracy. Later modeling using effectively models created for climate change and later modeling of soot, particularly as well as um, I, I think more detailed lofting, it, it is still, it's not certain that uh, such an exchange will generate 150 teragrams. It is highly likely that an exchange will de uh, generate a significant volume of soot and that soot will hit the stratosphere. So is this is worth considering. Where is that soup coming from? Is it burning, burning cities as well as counter-force strikes uh, have the potential to generate firestorms in... Uh, it will be primarily cities, yes. Yes, and there are, for example, there are discussions around that. There are estimates, for example, of the flammable material in the cities which are based upon the paper. I should stress, AllFed isn't generating this research. AllFed is using this research as an input. We're not certain that the 150 teragram scenario will be reached. We believe there is a distinct possibility it will be. So considering this scenario will let us prepare for more mild scenarios. And there is certainly the potential for events to generate such a loss of sunlight or a sunlight blocking event. So yeah, and primarily, the, what is affecting this is the downwelling solar flux. Rad far uh, lower volumes of radiation are hitting the surface. That is leading to lower precipitation and lower surface temperatures, the 8 to 10 degree loss there, the significant loss in precipitation. And you'll notice it's mostly over the oceans where it's far less useful to us. The only saving grace is relative humidity. It's expected to spike, so the evapotranspiration will drop, so plants in a much more humid environment are sucking up less, less water, but this is still a very significant disruption to our agriculture. Other teams, Gia et al, have recently published a paper projecting the <coughs> loss of uh, yields in this scenario. It's around 80%, 80 to 90% by year three as a base. This implies a si similar degree of mortality among the population and maybe even higher. So let's talk about what we think can be done. So. Here is the situation today in terms of food. We have about 5,600 kilocalories generated per person. And this is uh, produced, and this is where it's going to. So for example, about 2,000 kilocalories goes into the animal feed system. Distribution losses account for about 252 uh, kilocalories. Biofuels, about 800 kilocalories. Seeds, because we have to plant some of our crop back into the ground, about 120. And then finally, that gives us about 2,700 kilocalories per capita. And that's it broken down. Mostly crops, some meat, some dairy, some seafood. This should be stressed. This is very variable from person to person. And for example, some areas may be well above 3,000. Others may be closer to 2,100. And this is delivery to the retail level, which is where the FAO stops monitoring. So waste in shops and waste by consumers are also subtracted from that total. That doesn't mean we're physically eating 2,700 kilocalories. Estimates for waste are approximately 300-ish to 400-ish, and it's estimated effectively on base met metabolic rates in each region and how much weight we're gaining. is an approximate proxy for how much people are physically eating. After the nuclear winter, based on the Gia et al. figures, 80-90% of output will be lost, and this is focusing all output, ignoring animal feed, everything else, but with a bit of distribution losses still. This is what we have left. If we focus everything on feeding people, we still have a caloric shortfall. And they assume a breakdown in trade, which would further shock consumption. And essentially, at a bare minimum, 80% of the world would face starvation. 
That, should be noted, is a flow, not a stock. We will have stocks entering the shock, but the problem is we only have about three to six months worth of food if we keep on the current or the previous existing level of consumption, feeding it to animals, making it into biofuel, etc. We focused it all on people. We have about 12 months. That could hypothetically be increased through storage, but it's very expensive and will generate a significant problem in the short run, i.e. this will rate significantly lower food affordability while these stocks are being raised up. And it would also be a massive logistical challenge. For example, you can only store certain foods for so long. And if you're trying to store 10 years of a food that's perishable after seven, that is physically impossible. So some countries do have strategic stocks, most notably China. And there is the potential for strategic stocks to be a tool that governments can use alongside potentially the private sector that may manage them more effectively in order to smooth out shocks. But it's very difficult to have this for the whole period. Yes, we will. Why don't we take questions at the end, just for the. But um, and so yeah, without immediate action, around an 80% mortality for the global population is expected. And I should stress this does also ignore direct battle damage, i.e., we've assumed this 150 teragram injection has occurred without almost as if it was a volcano just shooting up into the sky. Thanks, and um. Yeah, the, there may be mortality, loss of infrastructure, etc., from, or there certainly will be, from a nuclear war that also will need to be modelled. So, where are we at? Early research proved the feasibility of actually producing certain foods. We can break from sunlight, because sunlight is a great resource. It's just in the sky, providing energy for free. But if that is disrupted, we suddenly face a problem. There are ways we can produce food. Cellulosic sugars, which are wood, produced into cellulose. That technology already works for cellulosic ethanol. We'd simply skip the last stage. And we also have single cell proteins. You can grow protein from methane or hydrogen gas. And seaweeds can cope with colder temperatures and lower light levels and don't have a problem of precipitation. So there are many ways we can supplement these foods, but they're not going to be enough in themselves. We can also switch where crops are cultivated. If an area is focused on maize that needs temperatures from 22 to 30 degrees and suddenly loses 8 degrees, that may be catastrophic for their maize yield. It may be fine for potatoes. There is the option of shifting foods around. We can move foods, and though this will require cooperation from the global north, and it will require a rapid shift in farming practices, which is a very non-trivial problem that also needs to be considered. Finally, greenhouses could help us make up the margin and could be expanded to both cultivate areas which are otherwise unavailable to us and increase the yields in the areas we are cultivating. So, the current research is a paper recently submitted to Nature Food and has passed desk review, where we are looking at stacking up all the resilient foods together. When they arrive, the kind of magnitude that you could expect, the kind of cost of them, what macro and micronutrients they are producing, whether this is a complete diet. Based upon what we have, we can provide a diet for the entire population, which is uh, right on the next slide. So essentially, this is just to highlight, we are up against thermodynamics. We need energy from somewhere in order to feed ourselves. That's fundamentally what a calorie is. And there are sources of energy in the world that we can tap into, particularly fossil fuels, cellulose, etc. And this may be unsustainable if we are making our entire food system out of it, but it may be fine for covering a period of 10 years, for example, to bridge a gap. So what we would see is approximately this leading up in the early years of the disaster and the worst period. A scaling up of these industrial foods, the production of cellulosic sugars and single cell proteins, expansions in seaweed output, uh, some production of meat, though greatly reduced, focusing ruminant production on dairy, and a shift of outdoor growing to the most cold tolerant variants could provide enough calories for everyone. And here's the the plotted diet in terms of calories, fat, protein. However, the affordability is also a serious problem. We produce 2,700 kilocalories per capita today, and not everyone is fed. Producing enough food is a necessary but not sufficient criteria to feeding everyone. And we'd be uh, increasing the amount of resources based on current prices today by about two times in the system, and we'd be producing half the food out. So some foods would be tripling or quadrupling in price. And affordability here is a serious problem. So what do we have next? We have some thinking about these kind of issues. 
we're trying to see which areas would be most at threat, who could afford to subsidise their own food, where international transfers would be necessary and further support, and what kind of issues we would see here. Would people even cooperate if their populations were facing such issues and they would need someone else in turn? You'd be sending your food supplies off to someone else in order to tide them over, then they would send their produced food back to you. Would this be a, a feasible model? There's many different considerations around this, and this is a very complex system. So, this brings us on to the further research and how you can get involved. So, the integrated modelling paper was a good first step, but this is a global level. What we're going to do now is look at country-by-country country analysis, more detailed economic analysis. So, all we've done is affordability at current costs, but that is a very simplified pass. What will consumption be due to prices? Would we expect animal feed to crowd out human consumption? Will there be incentives to trade or hoard? Political analysis, will countries cooperate? Would it be in the interest to do so? Can this be maintained? And what policies would be very important to bring into this? And then finally, how can we move from all these abstract ideas in research papers into actually deploying it in the real world? And that will be potentially a decade of work. And more broadly in the organization, there are other pressing questions which are also unresolved. So smaller 10% shocks are also dangerously understudied, and these have an approximately 80% chance of occurring over the next century, and could push hundreds of millions into starvation. This would be a very different... So, for example, a inter-crop cycle failing, by the time some of these resilient foods have scaled, the next harvest has arrived. This isn't the tool necessarily to address them. Some uh, resilient foods, if they are already present, could potentially switch... So imagine they're producing biofuel, they could then produce human food. But if that capacity is not present, it was not available during such a shock, which will happen by its nature without warning. So these also need consideration, and potentially thinking about the politics here will be very informative in the politics in the 80% shock. Next, we need to think what we can do to build resilience into food systems today, particularly if resilience is expensive. Things like COVID have demonstrated that just-in-time is very low cost, but when it's stressed, can break and crack in bad ways. But companies cannot build just spare capacity into their systems without being, you know, some incentive for companies to do it. <coughs> what could be done to protect against a loss of complexity in industry? This is also an incredibly complicated question. And with the world so linked, this may actually, you know, complexity is likely to rise in the future. How can we manage this? And then finally, how do these issues tie into other development and effective altruist goals? For example, animal welfare, global poverty reduction, and climate change. So, as I mentioned, we are currently hiring. We recently got around a million dollars from the Survival and Flourishing Fund, and we're using that to expand our operations. There is also the option to volunteer. I myself started as a volunteer at AllFed and then expanded to full-time, as well as internship opportunities if you have a specific project, typically, either funding inside or outside, um, or either external funding, rather, or AllFed provided for a specific topic you'd be working on with us. And all kinds of backgrounds are needed. This started off as engineering considerations, i.e. how do we produce food without the sun? But now it's expanded to economists, agronomists, social scientists, programmers, and data scientists. Particularly, for example, we're doing GIS mapping of crop patterns and what that means for prices, the affordability of crops, given the amount of inputs you're putting in and the outputs you're getting out. And there may be many more areas as we expand. So yeah, please check out our website. And if you're interested, there's the newsletter at allfed.info. .eagx, and you can sign up there if you're interested in updates or uh, requesting volunteering opportunities. Thanks. So, yeah, sorry, I'm... Uh... <laughs> sorry, uh, I did see a few hands go up. Um, and if you're... Um, sure, on the left there. It's, again, it's, at, at the overall system level, it's potentially 2 to 3-ish percent of output knocked out. The difficulty is, this, it's a, a useful measure partially, but the, there is a problem which is, for example, a 2% shock may lead to a very sharp increase in prices or nothing, depending upon global stocks going into the crisis. We're at a fairly low level of global shock stocks, so this is bad. Prices have spiked quite noticeably on top of a high base. And any further shock is very bad because there's nothing in the system. There's no slack. So this is why it's quite concerning. As it stands, it will be bad is our approximate 
get. The, our approximate forecast is it will be v bad for food security, but not catastrophic globally. Any further shocks, we do not have space to adapt to. And this actually gives us a very interesting, at least dry run case for thinking about some of the policy we might need in a worse shock, i.e. there are things we could have done or can do, but we're not doing. For example, we have reserve areas in America where this is brought into conservation and it's held with no crops on just for various environmental reasons. It's good to do, but in a disaster, it should be planted with foods. We maybe aren't there yet, but it's not entirely clear what the process would be and whether it would have to go through, for example, an act, would it, you know, at, at what level the authorization would be needed, and we need to sort out these questions now. So the current shock is risky, particularly for places in MENA without stocks. Lebanon, Tunisia, Libya are particularly exposed and could get a lot worse if further, um, particularly if Russian output is disrupted from sanctions. But yeah. Uh, the question was uh, asking what the severity of the current uh, output shock was uh, to from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, China has a uh, has stock, sorry, yes. disaster support with food stocks. Um, yeah. The, Western nations do not grow. Yes. So, that situation? What is preventing us from... Effectively cost. Um, Back in the Cold War, countries used to maintain under their civil defense plans far more extensive stocks of food. Uh, and also because um, these were used to maintain farm prices. For example, the EU had vast reserves under the Common Agricultural Policy. Over time, these were deemed to be too expensive. Other means were adopted to support farmers' incomes and support farming, i.e. rather than just subsidizing per tonne, you were subsidized per hectare and potentially subsidized to turn your land into conservation land which was a, a shift away from just maximizing output and intensively using land. So these stocks were naturally wound down partly because they were so expensive. China maintains these stocks partly because they're concerned about domestic affordability, and they're used and released over time should global prices rise and place pressure. It's to, And, of course, they'll be of use in a disaster. Western countries seem to feel it's not worth it on the cost-benefit. There's potential arguments either way. It probably stocks aren't going to solve the problem in itself. They do buy us time to bring other solutions in. So stocks should be considered, but probably not in isolation. What kind of food is the best to stock? Grains are effectively goods that are very preservable or can be stored in bulk uh, in, for example, nitrogen or low oxygen environments. So grain is perfect, and it's one of the reasons why we cultivate grain, because it's so good at storing, versus, say, cassava and potatoes. But um, other, you can... It is possible to store something approximating a a full diet um, in storage. It wouldn't be a particularly, you know, it, it would be limited, for example, to grains, legumes, etc. Though interestingly, China does maintain strategic pork reserves and other commodities, including sugar. So it is possible to have large-scale freezing of different commodities, which China does because it's concerned not just about caloric intake, but the general consumption of its population. Sugar, yeah, sugar is eminently storable. And some countries do maintain sugar po policies and storage. But again, it's, it, it, it's typically, countries typically hedge their sugar by trying to encourage domestic production rather than necessary stocks. But yeah. Um, so you mentioned there was um, <clears throat> an emphasis on kind of encouraging engineers to get involved. Could you like, perhaps expand on that? Because like, I come from like, a civil engineering background, it's kind of good to see how people get involved. Yeah, so I mean, all Fed was founded by engineers initially. And it was coming at the problem, well, I believe David, uh, David Denkenberger, one of our co-founders, kind of thought of this because there was a, a report saying that, you know, post-nuclear war, mushrooms will bloom everywhere. So he says, why don't we just eat the mushrooms? And then looked into that and said, okay, not nearly enough calories. What, would, what do we need? So these kind of, so it started out as a production technology, but these kind of things are very important and particularly scaling at speed. So if we need, I don't know, 50% of global plastic, that is a lot of plastic for the plan. If we need 150%, something's going to need to scale. So thinking about some of these problems, but then also the complexity of what can we do in a disaster? What, what is feasible? You know, are there low-tech solutions? Are there high-tech solutions? What could be deployed? How would it move? Could we, you know, what do we need to get back up and running at short notice? 
what could be feasibly done to harden infrastructure today against shocks. So in the 10% shock, if it's a, I don't know, a natural disaster that knocks out a port, there are certain ports that supply, for example, Ethiopia is entirely reliant on Djibouti, Port Djibouti for its food supplies. If that, you know, is knocked out, at what speed would it recover? You know, various questions that could be considered and are surprisingly neglected. So there, there is still a role for engineering and I'd argue <coughs> civil engineering. But yes, it does, it does depend. So, yeah, certainly. So, our main, we, so moving into policy is a new area for us, and particularly the, delic the policy is incredibly delicate just because the, the, there are devils in every detail. So, you need to get it precisely right to give actionable advice. But we are currently, for example, cooperating. There's various bills in the US government which are reviewed periodically to assess food security, and there's the option to have, for example, biofuels currently consume a lot of food, but actually could be a very useful, almost shock absorber. It sounds odd, but producing excess food and turning it into fuel could be very useful if you can access that if needed. Currently, there is very little mechanism for doing so. And considering precisely because the market there is very complicated and nonlinear, i.e. biofuels are a competitor to a degree with fuel, but they're also a complement because they're blended and provide octanes, and they're a cheap way of adding octanes to your fuel. So... As it's currently structured, there isn't really a shock absorber built into the system. There may be sensible ways that are farmer positive don't hurt the farmer incomes. So the farmers don't care whether it's going to food or fuel, if they're getting a good price, that you could build resilience in into a system taking account of the politics. But this is, again, early stages and something we, we are very interested in looking into if people have skills and backgrounds there. Yeah. Yeah. So a very good example of that, for example, is locusts. So East Africa, uh, the recently there's an outbreak of locusts, and the current program is essentially locusts arrive and are monitored. The FAO is watching the situation, doesn't want to cry wolf and request funds when it doesn't need to, but when it's certain it does, it then asks for a round of funding, funding comes in, procurement occurs, and then a response occurs. But this can be several months after the locusts have started doing their damage. One of the things we are looking into, for example, with a team that's more focused on the financing side and direct financing today, is could we pre-secure finance and basically have a, a chunk of money ready to go, and potentially even pre-secure and procure the response. Have We know we're going to need chemicals and spraying technology, etc. Have that pre-procured and agreed. So as soon as physically possible, as opposed to as soon as bureaucratically possible, we can start a response. So that would be, this is a 1%, this is a regional shock, and very nasty for local farmers, but not, you know, it, it's not a, a key exporter in the global food system, but it's still very important to consider. And I should stress, through all this talk, I've been talking about 10% shocks and hundreds of millions of lives. And the, it's very easy to get disconnected from the fact that there are, you know, even with that curve going downwards on the global food security, you know, getting better over time, there are still millions. I mean, in fact, I, I believe 600 to 700 million who are undernourished by critically undernourished under FAO standards. So there is definitely work to do today. It's just difficult. We need to find areas that are neglected because certainly to a degree, if it's, I don't know, the conflict in Yemen and it's physical access to food to a conflict zone, there's little that all Fed can do there. There's, unless we have suddenly an, you know, an idea that does fit, but we have to balance our resources with what we can do. No. Yeah, it, GM is actually a fascinating technology with a huge amount of potential. And we are, so for example, we even had a chat with Bayer who um, bought Monsanto and, you know, discussed breeding in, uh, you know, genetic modification as a, almost like a hedge in getting ready for shocks. You know, you can make crops far more resilient to disasters. There's a problem which is, this is expensive, primarily for the licensing, much like with drugs, you have to prove the food is safe. And that has to go through several rounds. It's also not able to be sold or grown in the EU at the moment. And therefore, because the EU has a trade deal with Africa under EBA, everything but arms, 
and the ACP protocols, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific protocols. African and Caribbean and many Pacific markets grow food that they want to be at least in principle able to export to the EU, so also ban GM crops. So there's limited penetration from that, high costs in developing it, and typically GM currently focuses on effectively maximizing output in normal years. So much like everything has a frontier, if you're breeding in genes for one thing, you're not breeding in genes for another. Even if it has no negative impact, you could have been focusing on another genetic package to put into your corn. So currently the focus isn't around this. We think there is potential here, particularly in principle, you could have seeds which are developed but not cleared yet. For example, they're not cleared for human consumption but could be in a disaster, i.e. much like with the vaccines. If you're, if you're pretty damn sure it's safe but not 100%, you could still roll it. But the difficulty is you'd have to go from zero to 100 very quickly. And if those seeds aren't being bred, you might be, okay, give me five years, I can cover your area in seeds. It's not enough. So GM is an interesting technology, but currently it's not really entering the picture. It would be nice if it could. I personally think it could have more of a role, but that's my own personal opinion. So yeah, probably last one, but thank you. It's, yeah, so it's, it's a very interesting question. And the problem is making, the globalization hap, happened for a reason. It's very good at producing, for, you know, low cost goods and services for us all. And to a degree, we want to use that technology. It's about potentially just going purely for average profit or even like highest profit in the good years may not be, the best op you know, for the full system. So these two need to be balanced and it's a very delicate balance, which is gonna be very difficult, but it, it requires, even for somebody who's very, you know, I believe there'll be a very strong role for the you know, sort of private enterprise and coming up with good ideas in these disasters. This kind of needs government action to coordinate because companies, if imagine you can't run for five years at a loss versus your competitor, you are then forced to squeeze every margin down such that in the disaster, everything can collapse. So there are some sensible policies which could take pressure off. And to a degree, this it doesn't have to be... In the past, food insecurity was made much worse by protectionism, the idea of protecting your domestic farmers against competition and having no, you know, severely restricting this trade. Reducing that has been good. There may be some niches where trying to ensure that supply chains aren't incredibly complex and there is some local production... And interestingly, there's been moves very recently with this. It's going to take potentially five to 10 years. Countries have suddenly realized fertilizer stocks or fertilizer production all being concentrated in certain countries, including Russia uh, and Belarus, is a bit concerning. So Brazil, for example, is launching uh, prospecting and uh, mine sinking uh, efforts in potassium. And there will be others. So countries are already looking at this as a system, but it is something that also needs to be considered. Anyway. Thanks, everyone, and I'm glad you made it to the uh, change time. It was a bit awkward that it got changed at literally half an hour notice, but thanks, everyone. And, yeah, thank you.